Hi, welcome to our online webinar called Birds in Crisis, What Can I Do? My name's Eileen Fielding. I'm the director of the Sharon Audubon Center in Sharon, Connecticut, which is part of the National Audubon Society. And this uh, webinar is a companion to an exhibit being mounted in Salisbury by the Salisbury Association. I'm going to start sharing my PowerPoint screen with you in just a moment and we will get started. Be right with you. Okay, now we're ready. And I am going to get rid of my video image because uh, we don't want to use up a lot of bandwidth and um, possibly drop the images here. So here I disappearing and let's take a look at this webinar. As I said, this is a companion piece to an exhibit put together by the Salisbury Association Land Trust in partnership with the Sharon Audubon Center and the Housatonic Bell Association. That exhibit was scheduled to open as a, an exhibit at the Academy Building in Salisbury in mid-April, but since all of us are staying safe at home, it's been converted for now to a virtual exhibit that you can access on the Salisbury Association's website and we'll share that link later on. At some point when it's safe, the physical exhibit uh, will be mounted. And I would like to have a huge shout out and a thank you to Lou and Elaine Hecht, who helped put that exhibit together and they're making it possible in its virtual form as well. So on to Birds in Crisis. Why a presentation about Birds in Crisis? Well, it's really a follow-up and a response to some of the news that was published in fall of 2019 about the state of birds in North America. On, at one point, the National Audubon Society, of which Sharon Audubon is a part, published a special issue on climate. And we'll talk about, more, uh, talk about that more in a few minutes, but uh, right now, I will just say that it showed on the basis of extensive scientific study how 389 species of birds in North America could lose some or most of their habitat in the coming decades, depending on the magnitude of global warming. So that's a look into the future that's a little concerning. Um, there's also a study that was published in September that took a look at the past five decades of birds in North America. Ken Rosenberg, uh, from Cornell University and other researchers, published in Science an article called Decline of the North American Avifauna. And here were some of the major findings. First, the losses of birds across North America are widespread. It's not just rare birds, it's common birds too. And it's not just some habitats, it's across most habitats. The mention of biomes here refers to major landscape types like uh, spruce forest or deciduous forest or grasslands. The losses are, are widespread over those biomes. And the numbers, not only do we have all kinds of birds in all kinds of places declining, large numbers of them are declining. A loss of almost 3 billion birds since 1970, 30% drop almost. And then just to drive the point home, they also looked at weather radar over the last 10 years. Now, why weather radar? Well, that's because when you look at a weather radar map and see those green blobs on the map, that's not always weather you're looking at. Sometimes that green blob is birds. We can actually watch the migration movements of birds with that same radar. And the data showed a steep decline in the sheer mass of moving birds during bird migration. So the bottom line here is that there's an urgent need to address whatever threats are causing these losses in the past five decades and what might be causing further losses uh, in the future, uh, especially due to climate change. So what are the threats? What do we need to do to conserve birds? What can we do? 
Well, let's look at the habitat of our birds, which is to say the birds of the Eastern United States, rather than tackling all of North America. <laughs> In this part of the country, the natural vegetation is forest. If you ignore a lawn for 10 years, it grows trees. And the birds we find in the Eastern United States, for the most part, need forest. They're adapted to breed there, they're adapted to winter there, or they pass through uh, and use the forest as stopover on uh, their migration routes. So uh, at Audubon, we refer to this uh, Eastern forest as the Atlantic Flyway. Uh, which refers to the entire uh, north-south annual traffic of migrating birds. So not just forests, but along the coast as well and, and through the mountains. Um, but it's a very important flyway for birds. The forests of the Northeast, especially New York and New England, Southern Canada, have some of the highest densities and diversities of forest breeding birds found in the whole continent. And here, like everywhere else, birds are in decline. A majority of breeding birds in the eastern forest are going down in numbers, and some of them very significantly. And I'll introduce you to some of those birds in a moment. But first, let's look at the green blocks on this map. What's that all about? Those are blocks that, forest, that uh, Audubon has identified as high priority forest habitat. Audubon has teams in a number of Eastern states who are working on what we call the Healthy Forests Initiative, working on enhancing forest habitat in these priority forest areas, but also elsewhere in, in uh, other forests. Because we know that a forest that supports a thriving bird population is more than just a bunch of trees. Birds need forest blocks of a particular size and they need forests with particular features that we'll be discussing as part of this presentation. So these green blocks are some of the best areas and we wanna keep them that way. And while they may be hard to see on this map, some of those blocks are in fact in Connecticut uh, and they're very important to us. So let's move from priority forest to the priority birds. This list here uh, on the left, that's just a short sampling of the birds that are experiencing significant declines since 1970. And it's also just a short sampling of priority birds. In New York and Connecticut, Audubon has identified about 50 species of priority birds. Some were chosen because their numbers are sharply declining, but actually others were given priority status because their presence is associated with a habitat type that's important and should be maintained. And if it's protected, it supports a whole group of species. So let's meet some of these birds. Let's start with this little guy on the right. This is a black-throated blue warbler. You can tell him by that uh, black throat and the little white handkerchief that he's got tucked into his wing right, right there. Um, this is a bird that does best in fairly large tracts of forest. They can live in hardwoods, they can live in mixed woods, um, and it needs dense cover because it nests within five feet of the ground. And we'll take a look at some other birds that have specific needs. Right here on the left, the Canada warbler. It's gone down 63% in the last 48 years. The Canada warbler prefers moist, mossy, mixed woods. Try saying that three times. <laughs> it likes down trees on the forest floor. It likes dense plant cover near the ground. It likes young conifers. So if you find yourself in kind of a wet mixed woods with those features, you can look for Canada warbler. Over on the right is the wood thrush. 59% population decline. Now wood thrushes like to be in forest with tall canopy trees, but where they nest is not way up in the canopy, it's in the mid, canopy, uh, the mid story. It needs shrubs for nesting. And on the ground, where it does a lot of edging, it needs deep leaf litter so that it can find lots of invertebrates, uh, which are the food that it would be looking for on the ground. Here are a couple of birds that uh, need early successional forest. In other words, young forest, forest that isn't mature and uh, 50, 60, 70 feet tall. 
And young forest is a habitat type that's becoming increasingly scarce in the Northeast. If we want to keep our young forest bird species, we do have to try to maintain a certain amount of forest in the early successional stages. The woodcock actually needs a combination of things. This is one of those birds that um, uses several different habitat types. It needs wet woods, it needs open ground, it needs young forest. It depends on the season and whether it's feeding or courting or raising its young. The golden wing warbler needs young forest because it nests in very shrubby areas. And it's fine with having some scattered trees among those shrubs, but the shrubs are very important to it. And that's often the form of young trees. Okay, now here on the left is a bird that you will see in the deep woods. You need to be in the deep woods and you need to be looking probably all the way up in the canopy, uh, way up in the tallest treetops. The cerulean warbler, which is declining 73% over its entire range, is a deep forest species. Now that's not to say that uh, it doesn't like a gap in the forest now and then. You won't find it generally near the edge of a forest, between the forest and a lot of open land, but you might find it near the edge of a little gap in the forest canopy where the sun can come in uh, a little gap in the canopy and reach the ground and stimulate some vegetation growing on the forest floor and in the mid-story. Because those little sunny oases in the deep forest can be very good for forest birds. And uh, you can find cerulean warblers near those. And then back to the prairie, 54%, that's another bird that likes young forest. It nests near the ground. Um, so that young forest cover is very important to it. A surprising number of forest species actually do nest right at ground level up to about 15 feet from the ground. So that might be a little counterintuitive, but that's what a lot of these forest bird species need is nesting habitat in, uh, in the bottom layer of the forest. Now yellow-billed cuckoos, um, down about 52%, they like woodlands as well. They like dense thickets. Um, so you might find them on a forest edge between uh, the edge of the forest and a fields where there's a really thick growth along the edge or in thick growth within the forest itself. You often find them near water. Um, and then there's the rose-breasted grosbeak. This is a forest bird that's not quite so picky. Um, they'll they'll uh, use a lot of different kinds of places and that's why uh, we're sometimes lucky enough to see them in our yards. Um, they'll breed in uh, forests, they'll breed in thickets, uh, they'll use edges and they'll also use semi-open areas. So they're a little readier to use um, our neighborhoods and, and our suburbs. So uh, we could do this for, another 40 birds, but we won't. <laughs> the question after you think about the specific needs of the species we've looked at is, why would all these different birds with all their different preferences all be declining? What's, what's the common problem here? Well, it seems that a common factor for all of them is an overall loss of quality habitat. And that, that's kind of a broad statement. But uh, let's take a look at what loss of quality habitat might mean for these birds. Well, again, um, the, in the eastern forest, uh, loss of quality might have to do with the fragmentation of the forest. This picture on the right is what you might consider an uninterrupted forest, but our forests are now pretty interrupted. If you cut a forest into small parcels like this, that means that the forest has more edge and less interior. And that means that the bird species that really need to be in the interior of the forest are exposed to hazards from the edge that they might not be very well equipped to handle. Think about nest predators that might prowl around the edges, uh, things like raccoons, house cats, crows. They're able to get into this forest and pose hazards to those interior forest birds. Uh, 
There are also cowbirds that can come in from open areas into the forest and parasitize the nests of interior forest birds by laying eggs in their nests. Another possible problem, and a very common one, is invasive vegetation, invasive plants. This woods is infested with what we're looking at here. Uh, the shrubs are Japanese barberry and multiflora rose. They're not native plants and they can easily displace the plants in the forest that are better food sources for birds. Then uh, in contrast to a forest uh, where you see a thick growth of invasive plants, you might not see a thick, thick growth of root, boy, a thick growth of anything. You may see a forest that's open and park-like. It looks very tidy. It's got a nice view through the woods. And we're actually inclined to like a scene like this. We often clean up a forest so that it looks like this and we do it on purpose. But what we're doing when we do that is we're actually making the forest look more like a savanna. And for birds that need actual forests, this can be bad news. And it's not always because of us. In fact, a great deal of the time, a forest looks like this because of very abundant deer. A deer can come along and browse away the plant cover that the birds would ordinarily nest in. Uh, they can even keep uh, young trees from regenerating altogether. So uh, that can be the cause of the, the stress on the forest. Uh, sometimes a forest looks like this simply because there's just too much shade because the canopy overhead is so dense. But in every one of these cases, the outcome is that the forest has little or no structure at that ground level or mid-level where so many forest birds uh, need to be having structure for nesting and for feeding. And then of course, forests can lose whole stands of trees or whole species of trees from various kinds of pest outbreaks. It might be insects like gypsy moths, emerald ash borers. It might be fungal diseases uh, like Dutch elm disease or chestnut blight. But in any case, it affects the uh, structure of our forest and it affects the diversity of trees that are in the forest. And then the new stressor on the block maybe not so new, um, but becoming increasingly dire, is climate change. Now, um, I'm going to stop here and say we have a whole presentation on the effect of climate change that is based on that Audubon study uh, from, that was published last September that I mentioned. Um, that presentation is survival by degrees, 389 bird species on the brink. And it covers National Audubon's report uh, it describes the science and it makes the point very clear that this isn't just a bird emergency. Uh, this is an emergency we should be worried about for people as well. But as I said, that's a presentation on its own. We can do it some other time if you're interested. But I'd like to show you right now just one outcome of the study because you can access it today if you want to. You can use it any time. This is something available online. It's called the Birds and Climate Visualizer. And if you are wondering what the effect of climate change could be on the birds in your locality, this is for you. What you can do, this is a, a screenshot of uh, what you'll see on the website. What you can do is enter your zip code or your state, and you can take a look at how bird species in that area will be affected uh, by climate change. I'm going to show one example of vulnerability assessment for our friend the wood thrush. And if you uh, ask for that, you'll see two things. The first is this map that's over on the left, and that's what will happen to the wood thrush's breeding range if summer temperature rises by one and a half degrees centigrade. Where the wood thrush will lose habitat is marked in red. Where the thrush will gain habitat is marked in green. And you can see here that overall the range is actually fairly stable. So the wood thrush would have low vulnerability to that change. Then you can take a look at what would happen if summer temperature goes up by three degrees Celsius. That's a whole different story. Look at all that red. 
the wood thrush could lose a major portion of its breeding habitat under those conditions. So in that case, the wood thrush would be highly vulnerable to that degree of climate change. The more range loss, the more difficult the species uh, uh, will find it to cope with climate change. And just to recall, this is a bird that's already in trouble. It's already steeply declining by a few percent per year. And this is just going to add to the challenges it faces. So, okay, are we all worried enough? <laughs> We've covered the crisis part, certainly. And now the question is, what can I do? And uh, the answer is that we can all do something. Um, there really are things we can do to try and offset some of these problems. Now, so far I've been talking a lot about forest, as if we all lived in the deep woods. Uh, we don't all. But um, even though I'm gonna talk about forest a little more, so we understand more about how we can help the forest out, um, what I'm describing can apply to yards and small woodlots, and then eventually we'll get out of the forest and get on to other things uh, uh, about how we can manage in other types of areas as well. And if you want to know more about uh, what to do uh, around the house and yard, um, I'll remind you again, you can visit the, the online exhibit about what you can do. So just a little bit more about forest birds here and what's quality habitat for them. The big key is diversity. We know forest diversity is important, but what do we mean by diversity? Well, there are several kinds. We can talk about diversity across the entire landscape. We can talk about diversity in the age of the whole forest or diversity in the age of individual trees in the forest. We can talk about diversity of structure in the forest, vertical from ground to the canopy, horizontal, what you'd find if you just went walking through the woods, um, going from one spot to another. And then of course, diversity in the species of plants in the forest. So we won't be covering all of that, but we'll take a look at a couple of things. Let's take a look at forest succession and birds. Forest succession refers to the development of a forest from bare ground all the way to mature forest and uh, old growth forest. And there are birds that use each stage of forest age. And if we want to have all the bird diversity we could have, it's important to maintain some of the early successional stages because there are birds like the woodcock, the golden winged warbler, the prairie warbler, um, and, and quite a few others that really depend on the early successions of forest. And then there are the birds that rely on older forest and big blocks of this interior older forest. Now, um, this is a little simplistic in a couple of ways. For one thing, uh, the birds don't always stick to one very specific type of forest. Let's take the golden winged warbler. It will nest in shrubs in young forest, but the fledglings often move into deeper forest for cover uh, right after they've left the nest. Wood thrushes will nest in the forest interior, but their fledglings often get a benefit from going out into these patches of younger forest where there's more, uh, more cover for them and more food for them to forage on before they migrate. In fact, the adults will, uh, will also do that as well. So this is a little oversimplified. Another thing that uh, could be misleading about this graphic, and I just wanna point this out, uh, if we're talking about the diversity of forest ages in a whole landscape, what we really want to see is mostly this. So what we aim for in Connecticut in managing forests is about 10% of the forest in early successional stages and about 90% um, in these older, more mature stages. And you don't want to be um, sawing a, a great big chunk out of a, a, a nice, healthy, big tract of mature core forest 
to make an early successional forest, you want to be careful where you place the early successional forest so you're not chopping up your uh, big forest chunks into, into fragmented pieces. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. So that's one kind of diversity. Now what if you just walk into the woods? What sort of diversity are, are you looking for in any given patch? Well, you want to see complex structure. It's great if the trees are at some different heights, if the trees are not all the same age. And by the way, in Connecticut, some, some woods we have are pretty much all the same age because they all started growing back from old fields at the same time. Um, but ideally, uh, eventually, you have a forest where there are trees of different ages and also different sizes. Uh, it helps to have some really huge old trees as, uh, as well as some uh, younger or smaller trees. You're looking for an understory, vegetation near the ground. You're looking for a midstory, vegetation that is putting out twigs and branches sort of halfway up, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 feet. You're looking for canopy cover. So the big forest trees that are sort of providing the roof, is that 100% cover? Is it 90% cover? Is it 80% cover? There are birds that uh, prefer any one of those situations. So uh, if you have some small gaps in the canopy, that can be a good thing. Looking for standing dead trees, also known as snags. Those can provide food because they're often infested with insects. And they're also wonderful places for uh, digging cavities, for cavity nesting birds, um, the owls, the woodpeckers, the chickadees, um, nuthatches, a uh, number of species. Uh, and if you have some uh, dead trees with branches that are sticking out into the open, those are great perches for the flycatchers to be uh, swooping out from and uh, catching insects in clearings. You're also looking for downed wood, lots of dead wood on the forest floor, big logs to little twigs. Might look messy to us, but it's all structure that birds use as habitat. And leaf litter. Again, sometimes we think of piled up leaves as something to get out of the way. That's actually a resource for birds because it harbors so much uh, insect food for them. If you really want to get into this, <laughs> we have some resources available. Uh, these are two manuals available from Audubon, New York. We do have equivalent manuals for, from Audubon, Connecticut. Um, I just didn't refresh the slide. Uh, but Managing Forests for Birds, a Landowner's Guide, is a great resource. Um, you could also just get in touch with us uh, about a workshop or uh, just a little bit of one-on-one -on -one information. We really do try to uh, work with landowners about managing their, their woods for birds. But let's get out of the woods now. Um, we've talked about the Healthy Forest Initiative. Audubon has another initiative called Bird Friendly Communities. And that's much more about meeting birds' needs where we live, because where we live, there are plenty of birds. And we really can help them out, uh, help out the birds that are living right where we live. Not that most of us live on top of the Throg's Neck Bridge uh, in New York City. Um, this is a little extreme, but you get the point. And uh, it's really about furnishing the same things for the birds in our communities as we would furnish for forest birds in managing forests. They need food, they need shelter, the migrating birds need stopovers and safe passage, and they need places to raise their young that are safe. So let's take a little more look at what we can do a little closer in to where we live. One thing that most of us can do to some degree is think about native plants. Now we kind of know that native plants are better for birds, but let, let's go into the detail a little bit here. A lot of the time when we think about plants for birds, we're thinking about the plants that yield berries and fruits. Okay, this is uh, sometimes referred to as soft mast plants, uh, the berries and the fruits. So we're talking about uh, high bush blueberries, dogwood, arrowwood, winterberry, um, blackberries, uh, all kinds of fruit trees, um, wild black cherry. So uh, a grape, um, Virginia creeper, even poison ivy, um, staghorn sumac. 
So lots and lots of trees and shrubs can provide berries and fruits for birds. Some of them are perfectly fine to plant in our yards. Um, and then there's what's known as hard mast, uh, the nuts. And uh, blue jays will eat a lot of acorns. Uh, so will a number of other birds like uh, turkeys, wood ducks. And also uh, plant, native plants provide a lot of seeds. Uh, this can come from wildflowers. Uh, it can come from uh, some certain kinds of tree seeds like birches. So uh, that's another important resource that native plants provide for birds. And then of course there's nectar and pollen. A lot of garden plants can be uh, native wildflowers that are uh, very good for birds. But there's one more um, very important high protein, high calorie, high carotenoid food source. Birds absolutely have to have it for raising their young and it's provided by native plants. And of course, I'm talking about the insects. Native plants support insects. And those insects, for the most part, really do have to have native plants. A lot of our native insects are no more capable of living off non-native plants than we are if we went out into the woods and tried to eat them. Most of them are closely adapted to the plants that have already been here. So think about that. Here's the situation. A lot of our forest and a lot of our trees, a lot of our bird habitat is now urban or suburban or even rural, but landscaped. So in that case, a majority of the landscaping may not be native plants. It could be 80% non-native plants. If you wanna know what we can do? This is an opportunity. We can fix that. And what a difference it would make. So how do you do that? Well, it's getting easier all the time to find uh, supplier plants. And we can ask landscapers to use them or we can find the sources and use them ourselves if it's a do-it-yourself project. So how do you do that? Well, one resource I'd really like to point out is Audubon's Plants for Bird program, Plants for Birds program. Um, that can be found at this website, which I'll share again uh, at the end. Um, if you go onto that website, and I hope we have time to, um, what you can do is select your zip code, once again, and plug it in, get a complete list of native plants that can be planted in your area, and then you can play with it. What you can do is specify, well, I'm looking for shrubs, or I'm looking for fruit bearing trees, or I'm looking for something that Baltimore Orioles would like. You, know, you, can, you can shape your search on this website however you want and come up with suggestions of native plants that you could put in your yard. And I don't mean to say that you absolutely would have to eliminate every non-native plant from your yard. Um, some of them are not invasive. Some of them are actually beneficial to birds also, um, but it really helps to, to start increasing the supply of native plants because a landscape that's all non-native plants is basically a food desert for, for birds that need insects. Another good resource uh, is the books of Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, his classic book, Bringing Nature Home, and then a second book, Li The Living Landscape. Great guidance in how to make a yard a native plant um, sanctuary for birds. And then let's talk about lawns. Do you really need your whole lawn? You might want to think about that. America's largest irrigated crop is grass, lawn grass. In the United States, that means that an area larger than Georgia is lawn. Now, lawns may be maintained with irrigation, as I just mentioned, but also with fertilizers, with pesticides, with herbicides, all for the sake of having the grass. Well, imagine even recovering a portion of that area as bird habitat. That could really have an impact. 
and it might be less work, it might be more, depending on what you replace it with. Uh, Steve Nelson in Missoula, Montana, uh, really, really went to town on this and transformed 75% of his yard <laughs> to native plants. And uh, it's, been, it's been going on for a long time. You don't need to get quite that extreme, but you know, if you can just think about converting part of a lawn part of an industrial park lawn, part of an insurance company lawn, part of a backyard lawn to native plants, it could add up to a lot of increase in bird habitat. And not only habitat for birds, um, doing that would also really help address the impact of climate change by putting more native vegetation on the ground that's resilient and that sequesters carbon. So that's definitely something we can do. Um, then there are cats. We love our cats. This isn't the cat's fault, but cats are one of the top human causes sources, human cause sources of bird death. It's hard to estimate, but the number of birds is surely in the millions. Some estimates are up to a billion birds annually taken by cats. And uh, one way to protect against that is to uh, give your cat a way to get outdoors that doesn't allow it to roam completely freely and, uh, and kill birds. There are such things as catios, <laughs> uh, sort of equivalent to kennels, but of course much nicer for the cats, so that the cat can be outdoors and get stimulation and watch world by, um, but not have access to the birds. Some people take their cats for uh, walks on leashes, but there are ways of keeping cats from killing birds. Also, uh, especially now that we have coyotes in the Northeast, there's a cat predator out there. Coyotes do take cats, and uh, it's also a way to keep your cat safe from becoming a victim itself if you protect it from ranging freely outside. So a highly recommended measure that we can do. Then there are windows. Windows are everywhere, and this is another major killer of birds. Again, up to a billion birds in North America, striking buildings and, uh, and dying from their building strikes. We see this at the Sharon Audubon Center Wildlife Rehab Clinic. It's a major cause of admissions. We see birds with beak injuries, traumatic head injuries, eye injuries, broken shoulders, injured breastbones, concussions. Um, so it's not always birds flying into skyscrapers in the cities. You know, that's obvious. You can see the birds on the sidewalk underneath. But um, an even bigger killer might be our houses that are surrounded by trees, uh, where the birds are flitting around at top speeds and simply not perceiving the glass and hitting it. So the solution to that, again, something we can do, something we can fix, make the window more visible. Hang curtains, hang blinds, hang strings or streamers, uh, put up a screen on the outside of the window. Um, there are even coatings uh, and types of window glass that have grid lines or, or uh, patterns of dots that just give the bird the visual cue. There's something here, <laughs> don't fly through it. It would be great if uh, at some point our building codes mandated bird visible glass so that uh, we could reduce this, this cause of death in birds. But until then, there are definitely things that we can do. And then we can also enhance habitat. Um, it could be that somewhere near your home, you've got great habitat for something like an owl, something like a wood duck something like a woodpecker. And the only thing keeping that bird, the limiting factor from keeping that type of bird from living um, near you is lack of a suitable nest box because maybe there's a lack of suitable cavity trees. Well, you can fix that by putting up a box. Um, Sharon Audubon uh, supplies bluebird boxes for folks. Um, we also maintain a series of nest boxes for kestrels, American kestrels, a little falcon um, that lives in northeastern Connecticut and throughout Connecticut. And it can really make a difference in the number of a particular species of bird that can live in an area. 
You can find out a lot more about bird nest boxes from uh, many sources. Uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, website has some information about nest boxes. We can also help you out with that if you contact Sharon Audubon. So I hope you do. Another thing is providing other kinds of cover. On the right here is a brush pile with uh, big pieces on the bottom to provide uh, some openings and some cavities for the birds to get in under there and smaller branches on the top. This is terrific cover. It enables some of those uh, uh, lower uh, ground level living birds to hide um, and it also protects them from the weather. And this might be a solution if you like your manicured woods and you don't want dead wood piled all over the place, but you can make a few brush piles in selected spots and it can make a big difference to the way birds can shelter in and around your property. And then let's think about the bigger picture here. We're trying to help that we see around our homes are migratory birds. So they're not year-round residents, they're traveling long distances and they may winter in the southern US or in Central America or in South America. So what's going on in their wintering grounds matters to whether or not they're surviving. And some of the choices we make affect the quality of their winter habitat. And one really good example is shade-grown coffee. If a coffee plantation is out in the open sun, there's not much vertical structure in that habitat for birds. Shade-grown coffee is a different story. There are trees growing over the coffee bushes and there's vertical structural diversity. There's more plant diversity. There's more habitat for the birds in those coffee plantations. And uh, given how much land those, those plantations take up, making that choice can make a difference for birds. And think about all the shorebirds that migrate up our coasts, uh, migrate up along the Atlantic Flyway coast. We all know that plastic is a problem and uh, it might be a bigger problem than we feel like we can handle, but let's get started on reducing plastic waste because it is a killer of birds. And um, the more that we can reduce our use of plastic and reduce the amount of waste plastic that's out there that birds can run afoul of, um, the better off birds will be. So do think globally <laughs> when you're thinking about what we can do. Now I'd like to finish this on a fun note because there's something you can do that can really make a difference uh, that's very rewarding. And that is getting out there, watching the birds and sharing what you see. You don't have to be a hot shot bird watcher. You don't even have to leave your house. There are ways that you can keep tabs on the birds and share what you see. And what you report gets into large databases about birds all over North America that enable scientists to track the status of birds. I have some examples right here. Project Feeder Watch, you can do right from your house if you have bird feeders. You can also do the great backyard bird count right from your home. Uh, it only takes a couple of days, uh, a few days out of the year. If you do like to go out and get cold in December, you can participate in the Christmas bird count, which is really fun. And um, I do hope you'll consider joining us uh, at Sharon Audubon for a Christmas bird count. The Breeding Bird Survey is another way you can participate. That's where a lot of come from that we were talking about earlier uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. That was not only scientists getting bird data, that was thousands of private individuals sharing what they saw uh, going out and watching birds. Right now, the Connecticut Bird Atlas is uh, in, in the process of being redone. So there are people all over Connecticut getting data for the Connecticut Bird Atlas. And there are plenty of ways you can find out more about this. And notwithstanding that picture on the right, it's something that you don't have to do in dense crowds of people. <laughs> you, can, you can do this 10, 20, 30 feet apart outdoors. Uh, you can do it all by yourself if you want to. 
And uh, right now might be a good time to start thinking about that. Um, we'd be glad to help you get started on that if you wanted to contact us. Um, okay, so here are some of the uh, 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 websites again. Um, and I just wanted to let you know, we can share these with you. Um, if you'd like a list of, of some of these resources, uh, we can make those available. Um, just pop us an email and uh, we'll try to get them to you. This is how to uh, access the climate issue of Audubon Magazine. This is where to access the Birds in Crisis exhibit. And, uh, oh, our contact information has dropped off. Oops, uh, has, <laughs> some of it has dropped off of this slide. Um, that's how to contact me, but you can also contact Bethany Sheffer, our um, naturalist at the Sharon Audubon Society, if you'd like to know more about any of this. And with that, I will wrap up this uh, webinar and um, hope that we will hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for caring about birds.